This video is brought to you by Trade Coffee. Thanks, Trade. Life is beautiful when we take the time to see it. It's all around us. It's in the details. It's right in front of us. But there's so much noise these days, so much vitriol. Sometimes, all that we can do is get a good night's sleep and get a fresh start in the morning with a good cup of coffee. That's what trade is all about. Take a short quiz on their website, and they'll match you with local brewers to deliver the freshest coffees around. Just choose your delivery frequency, and your coffee will show up on your doorstep in a compostable bag. Me? I like Necessary Coffees Colombia, and I'm delighted that they're actually just an hour away. We like supporting local small businesses, and this is a great way to do it. As you rate new coffees delivered to you, Trade takes that feedback and hones your matches with ever finer precision. In fact, if you don't like that first bag of coffee, just let them know and they'll ship out a different bag for free. So give Trade a go. The first 100 people who use my link in the description and take the quiz will get 50% off their first bag. Just be sure to enter the code 3BLINDMEN50, shipping free of charge. Thanks, Trade. Back in 2017, I named Sony's A7R3 medium format camera of the year. Yes, I know the A7R3 is a full frame camera. My point was really more of a question. With the same or higher megapixel count as most digital medium format cameras at the time, between 37 and 50, the A7R3 had and still has 42. The A7R4 now has 61. With the difference in sensor surface area between digital full frame and medium format, much smaller than the difference in negative size between the two in the film era, and with advantages in size, weight, price, autofocus performance, IBIS, pixel shifting, and larger lens catalog accruing to the Sony's advantage, what was the difference in the actual end result? In which formats favor? Could this camera spell the beginning of the end of digital medium format, or would it force medium format manufacturers to up their game while lowering their prices? Maybe both. Now, almost four years later, with the arrival of Fujifilm's 102 megapixel, IBIS and hybrid phase detect autofocused equipped GFX 100 and its newly released little brother GFX 100S, I find myself asking similar questions. Are these new cameras the final nail in the coffin of large format film photography, or will large format camera makers up their game while lowering their prices? What does a 4x5 large format film camera give us that the GFX 100 series does not or cannot? Well, there's only one way to find out. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to welcome you to episode one of a new series entitled Inspired or Expired. In the coming days and weeks, I will share with you my journey of discovery as I shoot with a 4x5 film camera for the very first time, inspired by and compared to, in fact, the arrival of Fujifilm's GFX100 series cameras. The GFX100 twins offer, it's easy for me to tell you this, the highest image quality I've ever seen from a camera I've actually used. But that fact is the basis of the motivating question, is the GFX100 series the highest image quality out there, full stop, given the digital workflow I now prefer? Of course, there are even higher megapixel count medium format cameras from phase one in particular, but at somewhere around 50,000 a pop, that's not an option for me. And honestly, not particularly interesting to me either. However, 
further inspired by the imagery and stories of legendary photographers who used large format film cameras, including Matthew Brady, who a century and a half ago captured the carnage of the American Civil War. Eugene Ache, who, through his work documenting a disappearing Paris at the turn of the last century, was either, it can be argued, a founding father or perhaps the progenitor of street photography. Berenice Abbott, who was so taken with Ache's oeuvre that she bought the entire contents of his entire studio after his death, worked tirelessly to promote his work posthumously, and then documented her own adopted city of New York. Arthur Fellig, the press photographer better known as Ouija the Famous, whose photographs of the seamier side of New York City in the first half of the 20th century were published as a book entitled The Naked City and served as the inspiration for the film noir of the same name released three years later. Dorothea Lange, the documentary photographer whose most important work brought to the attention of the American public the hardships of the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, and eventually her images were suppressed for decades by the federal government, the permanent stain of the Manzanar internment camp during World War II. Margaret Bourke White, whose documentary photography, combat photography, and special access to the Soviet Union before, during, and after World War II proved that a woman's place was anywhere she chose to be and gave up absolutely nothing in the way of bravery, talent, physical stamina or energy to her male colleagues. Ansel Adams, whose landscape photography remains unparalleled to this day. Joel Meyerowitz, the legendary and very much alive street photographer who eventually transcended his genre, first with color and then an 8x10 Deerdorf field camera, most famously used for his book Cape Light. And most recently, Pedro Guerrero, a name I'd not heard before, whose photography of the architecture of and working with Frank Lloyd Wright in the middle of the last century, most especially Taliesin West, and wondering if a large format stills camera would yield results too compelling for me to not relax my restrictions on digital workflow and my motto, futzing minimus. I contacted British startup Intrepid to inquire about obtaining one of their 21st century 4x5 field cameras. A quick exchange of emails ensued, and shortly thereafter, a package arrived with an intrepid 4x5 Mark IV. Thank you, guys. And so, our adventure begins. Although my photographic journey began more than half a century ago with a film camera and my own black-and-white darkroom, I'd never had a large-format camera in hand before last week. So... I have a lot to learn, but I'm excited because the promise of large format film photography, perhaps a better word would be possibility, is higher image quality, different visual signature, and greater perspective control than any currently available digital medium format camera. And maybe, just maybe, there is something about the process of shooting with a large format film camera that could lead me to see the world differently. For today, however, in episode one, I have a much more modest, very modest ambition to cover what it takes simply to be ready to shoot with a 4x5. Let's begin with the camera itself. A large format camera is barely a camera at all, at least the way we think about cameras today. It is really little more than a light tight bellows, bookended to an adjustable front standard to which one attaches the lens, and an adjustable rear standard to which one attaches the viewing screen and film holder one at a time. No electronics, no motors, no prisms. The shutter is in the lens itself. The Intrepid is what we'd call a folding bed field camera. In this regard, it is similar to the Graflex Speed Graphic of Ouija, or arguably the gold standard among 4x5 field cameras today, the Linhoff Technica series. But that's pretty much where the similarities end. Where the Linhoff is a $13,000, six and a half pound, essentially all metal hand holdable 4x5 with built-in rangefinder for focusing, built-in hood for the revolving graph lock back, and a number of degrees of movement across multiple movement types honed over 85 years. The Intrepid 4x5 Mark IV is a 
$400, 2.6 pound 4x5 camera from a new startup designed to sit on a tripod in the studio or out in the field, made mostly of CNC cut wood, hand finished, with a different but in the end comparable range of movement, with nothing other than the rear ground glass held in place by graphlock style clips for focusing. Though, to my delight, the Mark IV's back also revolves and comes with bubble levels front and rear, horizontal and vertical, which I think anyway makes it pretty much a no-brainer as the entry point for exploring 4x5-inch large format film photography. Although, I have been eyeing used Sinar F2s on eBay for months. They are beautiful and beautifully precise. Industrial art. But it is a different approach, a monorail system, and that discussion is best put aside for today. After you've chosen the camera, you'll need a lens. A little bit of research led me to understand that the crop factor of a 4x5 system is about 0.29. And after a little more research, I settled upon and found an absolutely mint Schneider Kreuznach Aposimar 150mm f5.6 on eBay. This gives me a full-frame equivalent field of view and minimum depth of field of, call it a 45mm f1.7. More interesting is how the lens on a large format camera works. The shutter is inside the lens, yeah, it's leaf shutter, manually cocked and then triggered by a cable release. At least if you want to minimize camera movement when you trip the shutter, which you do. I picked up this release by Velo, but here's the trick. Once you press the plunger, you release it by pressing down the little knurled collar just below it. Now, let's talk about mounting the lens because no bayonet here. No electronic connections, no EXIF data either. Instead, you attach the lens to a lens board via a retaining ring, which you then attach to the camera as I've already done. Primitive stuff and really gives you a sense of the distance camera bodies have come since the earliest days of view cameras. Because my lens came pre-mounted on a Linhof board, I didn't need to worry about mounting the lens to it. But if it hadn't, or when it needs tightening, I would have to buy one of these, a spanner wrench, to ensure that the lens was properly tightly seated. The Intrepid comes with three different sized boards, so that if you happen to purchase a lens without lens board, it's one less thing you'll have to buy after the fact. Once the lens is mounted, it's easy enough to clip it into place on the front standard. On the Intrepid, this is accomplished with a small Allen wrench with a couple of Allen screws at the top. Next, everything else. Although, I'm already getting hives just thinking about all the futzing. Next, you'll need film. I chose a 25-sheet pack of Ilford HP5+, Plus and ASA 400 black and white emulsion. Of course. After that, you need film holders into which you place each individual sheet of film and in turn mount it to the back of the camera. I picked up a pair of these Toyo film holders, each of which can hold two sheets, but having only four sheets preloaded is a little light. They come with built-in dark slides, just like a medium format camera, and this is critical, so look and listen carefully. One, you must load each individual sheet in absolute darkness. I haven't had my own dark room for decades, and if you don't have one either, you'll need a room in which you can seal off all light, or failing that, you'll need a changing bag, like this, by Kalt. I suggest you snuggle in up to your elbows. Two, this is a belts and braces kind of situation. So I got the bag and then found the darkest room in the house at night, which for me is actually down here in the bat studio. Three, before you futz with film holders, you will want to practice with your eyes closed until you can load the individual sheets into the film holders with your eyes closed. I'll put a link in the show notes down below to two videos made by other YouTubers who do a great job of walking you through the process. But we are far from finished. Since the Intrepid is not designed to be handheld, we'll need a ball head and a tripod. Yeah, like this. Fortunately, I already have pretty much the perfect setup in FLM's CP26 carbon fiber travel tripod mounted to their CB38-2 ball head. It's a nice blend of height, strength, and lightweight. It's not a small lightweight or easy to carry as my P-designed carbon fiber travel tripod, but this is not the time to whine about a couple of extra pounds in exchange for much better stability. 
Then we'll need a dark cloth and a magnifying loop to compose the image and focus the camera. I have this uh, cabin loop from back in the days when I used to look at my slides on a light table and uh, picked up this Harrison dark cloth, which you use silver side out to reflect the sun away and the way it's constructed, shed rain if it comes to it. That's about it, except for backpack, time, intent. A lab that can process the film and provide a very high quality scan, otherwise what's the point? And a light meter? Let me play heretic here and say, no. We live in an era when we've got something way better than a light meter, especially for large format film cameras. And that would be mirrorless cameras. Not only can we frame up the image ahead of time, but then we can preview and manually dial in the exposure precisely the way we want it in real time. Move over, Polaroid. WYSIWYG. This is a digital analog workflow that makes sense to me. Any mirrorless camera will do, even a compact point-and-shoot zoom like, say, Sony's RX100 whatever version, or an iPhone with appropriately precise app. All you have to do once you've set the lens on your mirrorless to match the field of view of the lens of your view camera and dialed in the exposure is focus and frame up the view camera the same way, confirm focus with the loop against the rear ground glass, transfer the information to the lens, cock the shutter, remove the dark slide, remove the dark slide, press the plunger on the release cable, immediately put the dark slide back in, Immediately put the dark slide back in. Yes, I know I'm saying both of these things twice. You know, turn it around so you know that it's been exposed. Press down on the collar to return the cable release to its ready position and move on to your next shot, which is actually easier than that sounds, though it doesn't sound really easy to me because we haven't even begun to talk about swings, tilts, and shifts but hold that thought for another episode. Although, yeah, there's this. The image will be upside down and not all that bright, which is why you have the loop, the dark cloth, and the inspiration maybe of 35mm Leica shooter Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was in the habit of reviewing his contact sheets upside down in a bid to more quickly separate the wheat from the chaff by forcing him to consider composition, framing, and geometry before even looking at things like focus and exposure. Unless this is an apocryphal story, but I like it. Let's wrap it up for today this way. To get into the large format game, we're talking about $400 for the smaller 4x5 camera, another 600 give or take for the lens, 350 bucks or so of goodies from B&H, Adorama, Amazon, and in my case, a mild case of the hives just from anticipating all the futzing and schlepping ahead of me. But in theory, this gives us the opportunity to achieve a level of image quality, detail, tonality, control over perspective, perhaps beyond what we can do in post these days, that just might leave one breathless and deliver a transcendental experience, allowing one to see the world differently. To some of us, Thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars for all of that sounds like a steal, but to others of us, that may be far too steep. I understand in either case. And if you don't have the additional kit I already had on hand and can't borrow from a friend or rent from somewhere, we're talking about rounding up your budget to an even two grand for a good loop, a sturdy, relatively lightweight tripod with sufficient height, rock steady ball head, and quick release plate. I'll Assume you already have a decent backpack to carry it all. There will be processing costs too, but we're not there yet, and they will not be significant by comparison. Of course, the most important things you'll need to bring are intent and a photographer's eye. On the other hand, what if we could get all of that image quality Maybe sufficient, possibly superior perspective control with the digital workflow I prefer with just this and a couple of SD cards and an extra battery. That is, after all, the promise, or rather, once again, the tantalizing possibility of the GFX 100 and 100S. At a price, it has to be said, in weight, complexity, 
and cash somewhere between 8300 and 12300 for a new GFX 100S or GFX 100 with this 32 to 64 F4? Or is there a better choice out there altogether? I think this is going to be a really interesting series. This video is brought to you by Trade Coffee. Thanks, Trade. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below. Picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com. Sending coffee money via PayPal or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it.